I'm starting to think we have a new senior day tradition on our hands because for the sixth year in a row, Notre Dame sent their seniors off the right way with a blowout victory over an overmatched ACC opponent. Reaction, takeaways, and more coming right up. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up and welcome to Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. Today is Monday, November 20th, and thank you for getting your week started right here by making this your first listen of the day. I'm Tyler Wojcik, and I'm the host. I'm a Notre Dame alum and producer covering college football for Fox Sports. And this episode of Locked On Irish is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 Moneyline bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. All right, let's get into it. Notre Dame defeated the Wake Forest Demon Deacons 45-7 to in the final home game of the season and the 500th game played inside Notre Dame Stadium. There was a lot of pomp and circumstance in this one, even for a senior day, which always includes a lot of theatrics and well-deserved theatrics, by the way. This is not meant to be a critique, um, but this was a lot. It was the final home game for Athletic Director Jack Swarbrick and President Father John Jenkins. It was the 500th game in Notre Dame Stadium, like I just mentioned. Notre Dame and NBC announced a five-year extension to their television contract right before the game, which I probably won't talk about a ton in this episode, but I'm definitely going to spend some time on that in the near future. And the one thing that I took away from this game as I was reading some different stuff, um, seeing some people's reaction on Twitter was that the majority of people's reactions and their takeaways from this game was entirely dependent on what their attitude about this team and this season was going into this game. Because there is certainly one camp, there's a portion of the fan base who at this point has just had enough of this season. Um, They think these games are meaningless, that Jared Parker needed to be fired yesterday, and that Notre Dame isn't really playing for anything uh, in these last few games. And it's really just uh, a waste of time. And if Notre Dame wins, it doesn't really matter. And if they lose, they might be mad. But in a way, it sort of reinforces their points and their anger about this team. And I'm not really even criticizing those people because I totally understand why people are frustrated with this team. Like, it's not like Notre Dame's win over Wake Forest all of a sudden excuses their loss to Clemson a couple weeks ago. But then there's another side uh, of the fan base that I think is probably the majority. It's a little bit more optimistic. And they're like, Disappointed for sure in the way that this season has gone, but they still look at these uh, next three games, well, one of those uh, including Wake Forest, and think, okay, the season might not be what we had hoped for, but there's still some things that Notre Dame can take away from this season. They can start building towards next season. They have a little bit more patience with Marcus Freeman and it being his second year, and I think I'm more in that camp. Like I'm definitely frustrated with the Clemson game and the fact that at one point this season, Notre Dame was looking like a legitimate playoff contender and going up against Ohio State like in, in the fourth quarter there my hopes and aspirations were through the roof, really. And obviously those came crashing down that night in South Bend. But I still think that Notre Dame has a lot to play for this season. And I'm very happy with the way that Notre Dame played on Saturday. And on partic- or in particular, I'm happy with the offense. And there hasn't been a whole lot of times this season, or especially in the second half of the season when I've been able to say that. But I thought Jared Parker called his best game as the offensive coordinator for Notre Dame. And I think that Every single level, every single position group on the Notre Dame offense delivered in a way that, frankly, we have not seen in one game uh, really since September of the season. It starts with the quarterback. Sam Hartman had a big bounce back game. I think it was his best game against a Power 5 opponent uh, in a Notre Dame uniform. He finished 21 of 29 for 277 pass yards, four touchdowns, no picks, and he was not sacked at all. And his stat line is even more impressive when you consider the fact that he started the game two of seven. It was not looking good out of the gate. I kind of joked with my friends in a group chat, like, way to stay hot offense after their first three and out. But then they got things going, uh, and they really turned it up in the second half. So that was great. And then when Steve Angeli came in the game and mop-up duty, he was really impressive once again. Um, We'll talk more about him probably in an episode down the road, but hey, man, I'm starting to think a little bit differently about Steve Angeli. Also, Notre Dame's running backs, uh, Audrey Estime, uh, in what is probably going to be his last game in Notre Dame Stadium, he finished with 22 carries, 115 yards. I was pretty surprised they kept him in in the fourth quarter. They clearly wanted him to get over 100 yards because he's probably going to be a finalist for the Doak Walker Award. And Marcus Freeman admitted after the game that he doesn't like keeping guys in for stats. And I don't know if he tried to say that to make it seem like Audrey Estime wasn't in the game to get 100 yards, 
that's certainly what it felt like uh, on the outside. But the position group that really broke out, and my God, did this team need it, was the wide receivers. Just a really great game by that entire group, and in particular, the freshmen. The wide receivers on Notre Dame finished with 17 catches on 22 targets for 256 receiving yards and three touchdowns. They were led by Rico Flores, who had eight receptions for 102 yards. And as I'm sure you've heard by now, it is the first time a wide receiver has um, over 100 receiving yards in a game since both Kevin Austin and Lorenzo Styles did it in the Fiesta Bowl uh, after the 2021 season, Marcus Freeman's first game as a head coach. And now he finally has another guy do it again. And uh, the trio of true freshmen in this game, Jordan Faison, Rico Flores, and Jane Greathouse finished with 15 receptions, 212 yards, and three touchdowns. For the, uh, for the bulk of this season, Notre Dame has had to rely on their freshman wide receivers, and there have been obvious growing pains because they've had to do that. But this was the first time that you really saw all three of them together have a really nice game. Really happy for Jane Greathouse because he had that touchdown catch, and he looked really fast. He's been dealing with a hamstring injury throughout much of the season ever since the Ohio State game. To see him run full speed, it was like, okay, now he's finally healthy. He's making plays on the ball. That was great to see. And you look at these three – these three true freshman wide receivers in a game like that. And Jordan Faison, like, going into the season, we weren't really talking about him at all, even though uh, in fall camp he had some flashes for sure. But at the time, he was still like a, a walk-on who was on lacrosse scholarship at Notre Dame. So if you think about it, Notre Dame has those three guys who all look like hits, plus they have Braylon James and K.K. Smith, who are two wide receivers who are also in that class, who these coaches have talked really highly of. The Notre Dame could potentially have five Really, really solid wide receivers in this freshman class. And three of them got to showcase it on Saturday. So really great to see that from that group as a whole. And then, hey, shout out to the tight ends as well. Eli Raritan with his first big game. He had three receptions, 39 yards, and a touchdown. Uh, it was his first ever catch, followed up by a couple more. Great, great for him, man, because he's had to deal with a lot two ACL tears since he started his college football career, um, and then to finally break out like that with Mitchell Evans being out. Um, just really happy for him, and Mark Freeman gave a lot of credit to him after the game for all the work that he's put in recovering and finally getting a chance to shine on Saturday. That was great to see. And then the offensive line, who was starting two new starters, Billy Shrouth um, replacing Rocco Spindler, who's out for the rest of the year, and then Ashton Craig, who was filling in for Zeke Carell at center, who was out with a concussion. I thought they played really well. The group as a whole... Uh, allowed zero sacks. Sam Hartman was hit three times. Uh, they did give up three tackles for loss. Uh, and Joe Alt had a penalty. He had a holding, so he stinks now. I think he clearly has to come back uh, for a senior year now to rectify that. Um, but I wanted to focus on Billy Shrouth and Ashton Craig there for a second because Billy Shrouth had the second highest pass blocking grade of any offensive lineman, according to PFF. And that's really impressive. I know that Wake Forest as a team isn't that great, but going into this game, we talked about their defense uh, as, a, as a potential problem for Notre Dame in that they might try to get after the passer a little bit, but Shrouth and Craig held strong on the interior. And as we start to think ahead to next season a little bit, there is going to be some serious competition along the interior of Notre Dame's offensive line at both guard positions. And there might not be a um, uh, competition at center because I assume that Zeke Carell is going to leave, even though he has one more year of eligibility. The coaching staff has raved uh, both publicly and privately about Ashton Craig, and we're starting to see why um, he had another he, or he had a good game on Saturday in his first ever start after coming in on the Clemson game to fill in for Zeke Carell. So that was really exciting to see. And as I mentioned earlier, we got to give some credit to Jared Parker. And I know that there's not a lot of fans who want to hear that right now, but he really did call a great game. I know that they didn't start out great, but. They started to incorporate some things in this offense that we really have not seen a ton of as of late. Most notably, play action. The fans have been calling for it. The media has been calling it. Everyone who's been watching Notre Dame football lately has been wondering, why did they only run play action two times against Clemson? And it's not like play action is some cure-all, some fix for all the problems on Notre Dame's offense, but at the very least, it makes the defense have to think twice. It puts them into some disadvantages going up against Notre Dame because they have been so run-heavy for so often, and they like to run so many run-heavy sets, but Notre Dame was able to flip the script a little bit in this one. Um, according to uh, PFF, Sam Hartman went 8 of 11 for 126 passing yards in two touchdowns when he ran play action, and it wasn't just that they were running play action. They ran a lot more run-pass option 
concepts than we've seen a lot from this se- uh, from this team this season. And it created some really big plays for Notre Dame. The wheel route uh, to Devin Ford out of the backfield was a great play, especially because Ford is in there to block more often than not. And that I think Wake Forest certainly expected him to block because they didn't cover him at all. He was wide open in the end zone. Sam Hartman was able to get the ball to him there. Um, I really like Jared Parker's call on fourth down. I like the, the play to go for it. First of all, on fourth down, and then they ran a great man beater concept that set up Rico Flores for the first down. Another great play by him. And something else on Rico Flores, it's pretty clear that without Mitchell Evans, uh, Sam Hartman's most trusted target now is Rico Flores, and that says a lot for a true freshman. And yeah, I I realize that Sam Hartman doesn't have a ton of options to really trust at this point, but the fact that Rico Flores has solidified himself as that guy, as that trustworthy guy, especially on a fourth down play, says a lot about the true freshman and the work that he's put in this year um, and the time he spent trying to learn the playbook and gain that trust from a guy who's a six-year senior, who's like six years his senior compared to Rico Flores. And he really showed what he could be uh, as he continues to, v- to develop as a wide receiver. Because he doesn't have like that breakaway speed that like a Will Fuller has or anything like that, but he's a guy who can make plays and then get some yards after the catch. Um, I also thought the play-action touchdown pass to Eli Raritan was an absolutely beautiful play design and a great fake by Sam Hartman. He completely froze a Wake Forest defender who had a beat on him, but then he just sort of hid the ball in front of him, and the Wake Forest player just completely stopped, and then Hartman delivered an absolute dime to Eli Raritan. That might be one of his best passes as the Notre Dame starting quarterback, so that was great. And the touchdown pass to Jaden Greathouse was another play-action play uh, that was set up perfectly. Wake Forest safety dove in uh, to try to stop the run, and then that left a wide-open space uh, in the field for Jane Greathouse to catch the ball and then run for a touchdown. So overall, I was really, really happy with what Notre Dame did uh, uh, on offense. And if they're able to play like that against Stanford in the bowl game, this Notre Dame team is going to finish 10-3. And that should excite the entire fan base because I understand that there are definitely some people who are probably a little bit upset by the fact that Notre Dame's offense was looking um, and playing as well as they were on Saturday because they just want Jared Parker out so badly. And look, I said this on the mailbag last week. I think odds are Jared Parker will be back next year just based on me trying to predict what's going through Marcus Freeman's head. I'm not saying that he should. I just think that's what's going to happen. So we should root for Jared Parker and want to see him grow uh, as well as the players. And I think that Saturday was tangible proof that this offense can perform at a high level and that Jared Parker has the ability to get creative in the passing game uh, and create some easy plays for the Notre Dame offense to have success. And even if you don't think Parker's the guy, I think you should want him and the offense to continue to grow and play well throughout the season because even if he's not around next year, even if Notre Dame does finish with 10 wins and Marcus Freeman decides, hey, I want to go a different direction, I think the players uh, and the confidence and the experience they uh, generate playing this well getting these wins, even if it's against inferior competition. I really think that goes a long way, uh, and it's going to be extremely valuable for the entire group down the road. So really impressed by the offensive performance, and part of that is because we didn't really see it coming. On the other hand, I think we all expected the Notre Dame defense to dominate Wake Forest offense, and once again, Al Golden's group delivered. More on that right after this. Today's episode is sponsored by Listening.com. Have you ever wondered why don't textbooks and research papers come with audio versions? Wouldn't it be amazing if you could listen to it just like an audiobook? Thanks to Listening.com, now you can. Listening.com is an app that turns academic papers, textbooks, PDFs, websites, and emails into audio so you can listen to them on the go. Instead of sitting at a desk to read, the app frees you up so you can learn from pretty much anywhere. It's the best app in the world for listening to academic material because you can read math equations, automatically skip citations and footnotes, and it can pronounce difficult technical words. And even if you're not a student, listening.com is incredibly useful in the workforce as well. The best part is if you go to listening.com slash locked on, you'll be able to get your first three weeks for free. That's listening.com slash locked on to get your first three weeks for free. Before we move on, I want to remind you to please like the video below and subscribe to the channel if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening to the podcast, please rate the show five stars, leave a review if you're feeling nice and subscribe from wherever it is that you get your podcast. All right, let's talk about that Notre Dame defense because every time I feel like I'm running out of words to just talk about how great they are, they do something new to impress me and Saturday was no different. And Yeah, I understand that Wake Forest offense has not been great this year, uh, to say the least, to be honest with you. But even then, I think you got to tip your cap 
to Al Golden and his defense yet again. They held Wake Forest to just 4.1 yards per play for the game, and they had the real turning point in this one because for as great as the offense played, the game was still in jeopardy coming out of half. Notre Dame was only up 17-7, to and then J.D. Bertrand got a huge sack and a forced fumble that was recovered by Riley Mills, and I actually started laughing watching the replay because Riley Mills was like clearly down when he got the ball, but he tried to get up and return it and went down again, obviously, but... I thought it was great that in his last home game, or potentially his last home game, the big man wanted to score, and he was going to try to get away with it. It didn't happen, but it was still a huge play for the Notre Dame team because as soon as that happened, Notre Dame got the ball back, and that's when Sam Hartman hit Eli Raritan over the top for the touchdown that put Notre Dame up 24-7. to And unfortunately for Wake Forest, that was the game because even though when Notre Dame was only up 10 um, and Notre Dame's defense had Wake Forest under control for most of that first half, you're thinking, okay, maybe if they're able to get a turnover or something, Wake Forest can make this a game. But once Notre Dame went up by 17 points, like you just knew that Wake Forest was not going to get anything going offensively uh, to be able to come back from that deficit. So I was really, really excited about that moment in the game, and especially to see two seniors make the play, J.D. Bertrand, who's likely playing in his last home game, uh, make a play like that, and Mills right there for the recovery. That was huge, and that was huge for the offense, too, because they got some momentum coming, um, coming off of that play, and that was it. That was the game, really. And when Wake Forest did get the ball going or did get the ball moving down the field, they really only had it going because they had a couple trick plays on one drive. And I actually give them credit for running two trick plays in the same drive. You just you don't really see that that often. And it makes you wonder why they didn't run more in the second half. Um, I was actually going to make a comparison to that Ted Lasso episode when they run a bunch of trick plays, but I feel like... Uh, people who consume sports media are so tired of journalists making Ted Lasso references. So you know what? I'm not going to do it. I'm going to avoid it. But if you've seen the show, you know what I'm talking about. So anyway, uh, Wake Forest ran a couple trick plays. They were able to get that touchdown. Um, They did have some success running the ball. They finished with 134 yards on the ground in total. Although 20 of those came on the backwards pass which is technically a rushing play. Uh, And they added another 14 on a quarterback scramble. So it wasn't really like they had the running game going. And Tim O'Malley from Irish Illustrated had a great stat. He said that Notre Dame stuffed them on 13 rush attempts, which is obviously a really good number. Like Wake Forest needed to be able to run the ball to beat Notre Dame. They just couldn't do it. Even though they finished with 134 yards, that was not going to be enough to beat Notre Dame or really put a scare into the Notre Dame defense at all. Uh, The Irish also had several havoc plays. They finished with three sacks, six TF. NFLs and three passes defended. And I, at this point, Notre Dame has clearly one of the top passing defenses in college football. They're second in the country in pass efficiency. And the fact that they were able to hold a Dave Claus and led offense to just 98 total passing yards is incredible. Like in this modern era of offense, when passing is everything, you can basically just write in at least 150 yards passing to the worst teams in the country. And Notre Dame's defense completely shut them down. And I know Michael Curran isn't going to be making his way on NFL draft boards anytime soon. It's just another really great game by the Notre Dame secondary. Wake Forest's longest pass play on the game was a 17-yard pass on Thomas Harper. And I'll admit it wasn't his best game. He did allow three catches on five targets. But Notre Dame's starting quarterbacks gave up a total of four (laughs) yards passing. Nobody caught a pass on Benjamin Morrison. And I know that he had that weak-ass pass interference call, but that was just a terrible call. I'm not even counting that, all right? That's not even a negative. Notre Dame ended up uh, shutting Wake Forest down in that drive anyway. And then Cam Hart gave up a four-yard pass play, and that was it. So Notre Dame starting cornerbacks were shutting them down. And then when they brought in the reserves, Christian Gray, I've raved about him before on this podcast. I cannot wait to see him get some regular action once Cam Hart leaves after the season. Look, I love Cam Hart. I'm just saying I'm excited for Christian Gray's future. He uh, had a huge hit on the sideline uh, to stop Wake Forest from getting a first down on a key third down early on in the game. Great play by him. Jaden Mickey, who I've been pretty critical of on this podcast, he had a nice play on third down as well. So it was great to see those guys come in. And uh, one quick thing I forgot to mention about Christian Gray, he's got to get a new number. He is way too good to be number 29. I realize that he's probably only wearing that number because he's a true freshman. And next year, uh, once some older guys leave and some better numbers free up, I think he'll probably have earned a better number. But it was just something I noticed during the game that I felt like I had to share on this podcast. Anyway, let's get back to the Notre Dame defense as a whole. They allowed just 
71 points in eight total touchdowns in six home games this season. It's really unfortunate that they don't get to walk away from this season uh, with a clean sweep of their home games this year. We're not going to go over the end of the Ohio State game again. We've done it enough. But just a a really impressive game from this unit uh, as a whole once again. They are now seventh in the country in scoring defense. They're only allowing 16 points per game. And for as much as the offense has frustrated us at times this season, the defense deserves all the credit in the world for playing at a championship level throughout this season. And they're going to lose some guys definitely after uh, after the season ends. But the one thing that should make you feel confident about this defense going forward is one, expectations weren't particularly high for this group from the outside going into the season. And the fact that they're able to play at this level is really encouraging. Um, And it says a lot about what the coaching staff is able to do. Uh, I really hope that Al Golden and Mike Mickens and company are around next year because I think that they can continue to build, uh, especially when you think about the guys and the talent that Marcus Freeman has been able to bring in since he joined the staff as a defensive coordinator way back in 2021. And as those guys have developed, And then now we're going to start to see them really shine next season when they get their opportunities on the field. If you have that coaching staff uh, combined with that amount of talent, even if they're on, even if they're inexperienced, I feel really good about the future of the defense going forward. Also, can't forget about special teams. Uh, they came up big in this one. I mentioned the onside kick earlier. I, I, I could not believe they did that when they were up 24 to seven on Wake Forest. It just seemed like a random time to do it. But Marcus Freeman said in the post game that. Uh, in the lead up to the game, they saw an opening on film to do that onside kick based on the way that Wake Forest was lining up. They were just lining up way back on their kickoff return unit. And after a couple of kickoffs in the game, it was still there. And Marty Biagi and the team were pushing for it. So he gave the green light. Great play by Spencer Schrader and DJ Brown. Great execution there. Um, they had been practicing it all week. Spencer Schrader had a perfect onside kick there. D.J. Brown recovered it, and it was huge. Even though Notre Dame didn't do anything on that ensuing possession, it was actually a really gross offensive possession after that. Uh, it was still a really aggressive play call, and I love it. I love seeing Notre Dame just try to uh, just try to put the game away in a situation like that when they had all the momentum in the world. And really, uh, even though they weren't able to capitalize on offense, I thought it was a great play by special teams. Um, Spencer Schrader did revert back to some old habits on his first field goal attempt of the game when he shanked a 47-yarder wide right. Uh, but he bounced back with a big uh, made field goal attempt going into the half. Uh, so I'm glad he was able to get one more in his last home game in Notre Dame Stadium. Uh, what else happened on special teams? Jerry Price had another uh, nice kickoff return. I actually thought he was going to house that one. I was pretty surprised when he got when he got down, but he just kind of shows those flashes, man. When he has the ball and he's in open space, you think he could take anyone deep, and uh, hopefully next season if he sticks around, he's going to get a lot more touches and be able to make some big plays on offense. The biggest special teams play of the game, though, even though they, that onside kick was great, came courtesy of Javante Jean-Baptiste, who blocked a field goal attempt with his elbow. It looked like he could have blocked it with his head because the kicker kicked it so low. And I think, yeah, it was Jason Anye who said after the game, he's like, yeah, we knew we were going to block one. The kicker kicks the ball super low. And credit to them. They did. Uh, they got it done. They made a, they made a play there that prevented Wake Forest from getting points on the board. And then, of course, Xavier Watts is the one who's going to return it. Um, again, I thought he might be able to take it to the house because he's just such a natural ball carrier, but he only got a 20-yard return. So, again, maybe he has to come back for a senior year because he wasn't able to score a touchdown there. Um, one last note on special teams. I love Chris Tyree. I hope he comes back next season uh, so he can continue to, to develop as a wide receiver. I think he'd really help the offense. But even if he does come back – can we please just keep Jordan Faison back there returning punts the rest of the way? Because even though he had like a, I think it was an eight yard return, he just looks so shifty. And I get so excited when he has the ball in his hands. He is just that dynamic. And uh, he's got a really bright future at Notre Dame. And I just think that one of these days it's going to happen. Could be next year. Could be a couple years from now. But Jordan Faison is going to have an absolutely massive return for a touch. It could be punt, could be kick. It's going to be a huge game. And I'm going to try to come back to this clip and repop it whenever it happens, because I am just that confident he's going to get it done. All right, now that we've covered all three phases by the Irish in this one, we'll put a bow on Senior Day and start looking ahead to what's next for the Irish in their final two games of the season right after this. We got some really exciting stuff going on here at the Locked On Podcast Network. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. So go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel.
Score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action than now. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. And we've got a huge game in the NFL tonight. Uh, it's a rematch of last year's Super Bowl on Monday Night Football between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Philadelphia, Philadelphia Eagles. Right now, the Eagles are getting two and a half points on the road. Uh, I think Philly wants revenge for how the last Super Bowl game ended, and uh, I don't really have a lot of confidence in Kansas City's receivers right now. I know they got Mahomes, but I think uh, Philly is the better overall team, and I like the Eagles to cover the spread on the road tonight on Monday Night Football. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. So as we wrap up senior day here, there's a couple more things I wanted to mention. Uh, Notre Dame honored 31 seniors on senior day. But if you listened to the show last week, you know the majority of those guys have the option to return next season because of either a red short year or a COVID season. And here's some notable developments from the ceremonies. Running back Devin Ford, safety Antonio Carter, cornerback Clarence Lewis, safety Ramon Henderson, edge rusher Jordan Batello, and most notably Xavier Watts did not participate in senior day. It makes total sense to me that Devin Ford and Antonio Carter opted not to participate in the senior day activities because they do have one more season of eligibility. Um, and I think that was always the plan for them to play two years at Notre Dame. So if even though they are listed as academic seniors, um, they're probably just saving their senior day ceremony for next year during their actual final season in college. But um, I was pretty surprised to hear that guys like Clarence Lewis, Ramon Henderson, and Jordan Battelle and Xavier Watts were not honored because there have been plenty of Notre Dame seniors to do the senior day walk to go through the whole ceremony, even though they still had the option to come back, and then they ultimately – ultimately decided to come back. Like, it's really not that uncommon for guys to be honored on senior day twice. Now, does this mean that they're all coming back to Notre Dame? I would think that's the most likely option, right? But there's no guarantees. But I would just be pretty surprised if Jordan Botello and, the, and Xavier Watts, all those guys, had the option to go through senior day, which even if you plan on, uh, plan on playing college football that much longer, like having your family on the field, being able to celebrate that moment with them, um, I just think that's a really special thing in that if there were any doubt about whether they would come back next season or not, I would want to go through the senior day activities even if I was on the fence. Like if I was a guy like Xavier Watts who is going to have a, a decision to make after the season about whether or not he wants to return to Notre Dame and play one more year or just head to the NFL, like he could go through the senior day activities and then make that decision later. And uh, if he does end up going to the NFL, then, hey, he got to make the most out of his last game at Notre Dame Stadium. Uh, but – I think this probably means they're going to stay. Maybe I'm just sort of wishful thinking here and uh, crossing my fingers, hoping that that's exactly what ends up happening. Um, as for the guys who are leaving, we know Joe All is gone, even though he hasn't said anything to like confirm or deny it, but he's going to be a top 10 pick. He would be absolutely crazy to come back to Notre Dame for another year. Audrey Esme said that he hasn't made up his mind. He said that in the postgame presser, but he did concede that it might be his last game uh, in Notre Dame Stadium, and Marcus Freeman made mention of him as well, saying that it might be his last game. And uh, maybe the most surprising thing, though, that Audrey Esme said in his press conference after the game, which, by the way, he was wearing his full pads. He did not want to take them off anytime soon. Um, he mentioned going out with Joe Alt and Blake Fisher a couple times because they were in the same recruiting class. And like we all know that Joe Alt is gone, but if we were to read into what Audrey Kesame is saying there, he's certainly implying that he's going to go out with Joe Alt and Blake Fisher to the NFL. Now, we know that going into the season, there were some conversations about whether this could be Blake Fisher's last year as well with the expectation that he would have a really great junior season. He's played well this season at times, uh, particularly in the run game. I think he's been far more effective blocking uh, or run blocking than he has been pass blocking. But that comment took me by surprise. And I also heard uh, from a couple of people who were at the game that Blake Fisher sort of lingered on the field for a little bit after the game and was sort of soaking it all in. And now that doesn't mean that he's definitely going to the NFL, but I think what it does signify is that he's clearly deciding whether or not he wants to come back. I think he's definitely going to be one of the guys who – 
asks and receives an NFL evaluation to try to get a sense of where he would get drafted. And my hunch is that he's going to be advised to come back to college for another year. Jason Garrett even said on the broadcast that he thinks Blake Fisher should come back for another year because his technique is just not really as sound as it needs to be for him to play in the NFL. But hey, He's the one making the decision. If he wants to leave, if he's ready to go to the NFL, then so be it. But I just thought that was interesting, um, and it's something to monitor here in the next few weeks as these guys have to make their decisions. What else do we have on a senior day? Oh, yeah, Nana Osafemensa, uh, the defensive end, was seen crying. He was very emotional on the field after the game, and I think some people interpreted that as him taking in his final moments on the field. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think that he was more emotional because it was his class, it was his group of seniors that were going to leave. And uh, even if he decides to come back to Notre Dame to play in his sixth season in college, like a lot of the guys that he came in with are all going to be gone. And I think that's an emotional moment. There was also his ankle was taped really heavily, so maybe he got hurt in the game and realized that he might not play again for the rest of the season. I don't know. This is all speculation as to what he was thinking at the time, but I just did see some reaction thinking, oh, is Nana gone? Um, I don't know. That's a guy who is a clear leader on the team. He has embraced everything that Notre Dame has to offer. He really loves the place, and I'm sure that Notre Dame is going to want him to come back for a sixth year, and he's going to have a decision to make, too. If he wants to come back to Notre Dame, if he wants to go to maybe a little bit of a lesser school or lesser football program, I should say, and be the focal point, be the main guy, then that would make sense because I think even if he does come back to Notre Dame next year, he's probably going to rotate with some younger guys. So uh, a decision he's going to have to make as well, even if he's not considering the NFL. So now let's look ahead to what's next for Notre Dame. I already kind of talked about this at the beginning, uh, as we start to think about what this game means and what's next for Notre Dame, I, I think most importantly, winning on Senior Day is just it's it's extremely important. Um, even if it's not as important to some fans and beating up on a team like Wake Forest this year at Boston College doesn't mean that much at the end of the season. I think it means a ton to all the seniors and veterans on the team that they go out a winner, especially in this fashion, when you just kind of get to put it on a team and really soak it all in there at the end. Uh, it means a lot. And now the Irish have some momentum going into the Stanford game, and they really need to avenge last season's embarrassing loss. Like, the Marshall game was bad last year. I think the Stanford game was worse. That was that was just so bad. Notre Dame needs to go on the road and take care of business in a way that they haven't done in a really long time this season because – we know about the struggles on the road compared to home, but Stanford is not a very good football team. Notre Dame should absolutely roll them. I think they're 23-point favorites right now. So now they have some momentum, especially on offense, going into that game. They win that game. They finish the regular season 9-3, and three, which is about right where Vegas had them for the projected win totals before the season. Vegas was right again. Shocker there. Uh, but if Notre Dame is able to do that, they're almost certainly headed to the Rely Quest Bowl against an SEC opponent, which is going to be either LSU or Tennessee. A win against either team, uh, I think, would go a long way in how we evaluate the season as a whole. It's not going to excuse Notre Dame for the losses to Ohio State, Louisville, Clemson, all that. But I think it would mean a lot. A 10-win season for Marcus Freeman in his second year as a head coach uh, is a clear sign of growth, especially if they're able to beat a team like LSU. Uh, and if they have Jaden Daniels, if he's playing in that game, that's the potential Heisman winner there. I think that's a that'd be a huge win. And then I haven't even mentioned the Brian Kelly aspect. Like I don't have to tell you why that would be huge for Notre Dame, and it'd be pretty nice for me because I think that a lot of fans who might not have been as engaged in the second half of this season would be re-engaged, and there'd be a lot more people tuning into the show every week. So yeah, I'm rooting for that selfishly. Uh, and if you don't think that winning 10 games in your second season matters all that much, let's just look ahead or look at the other coaches who were hired in that same crazy coaching carousel cycle when Marcus Freeman was promoted to Notre Dame. Like Mario Cristobal at Miami has been a disaster. Lincoln Riley at USC, this season has been a disaster. Billy Napier at Florida, they suck. And uh, all of those hires are not looking good. Marcus Freeman would be on the higher end of all of those. He'd be up there with like Brett Venables at Oklahoma, who really turned things around in his second year as the head coach there. And Dan Lanning, who right now is looking like the best hire of that cycle, even better than Brian Kelly at LSU. Um, because, I mean, Dan Lanning and, and the Oregon Ducks are right there knocking on the door to make the playoff in just his second season as a coach. So even if Freeman's not at that level just yet, uh, he would be at the top uh, of that, that group of coaches, and it would be uh, I think a big, big moment for him and a big step for him to get 10 wins, even if it's not the 10 wins that we were hoping for. I think that's a huge step for him as he enters his third and extremely important season as the head coach of this football program. But that is going to do it for me today. Thanks again for making Locked On Irish your first listen of the day. For the everyday 
listeners, uh, we're going to have Luke Smith back on the show, as we do every Tuesday, to go over everything we liked and didn't like from the game on Saturday, and then we will turn the page to the Stanford game on Wednesday's show. Remember to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you're listening to the podcast, and follow us wherever you do your social media. Uh, the Twitter account is at Lockdown Irish. The Instagram is at Lockdown Irish Pod. And my personal Twitter account is at Tyler, W-O-J-C-I-A-K. Same time, same place tomorrow. See you then.